Coming up, she was never a risk taker until she discovered this. I'm still scared, like it still scares me today, and I have 128 jumps. Cherokee Nation citizen Crystal Acuff Walters tells us how jumping from a plane can be therapeutic. Plus, at 83 years old, Lorene Drywater is still at it, the only known Cherokee artist making buffalo grass dolls. Mama showed me how. I paid attention to everything she done, and I've been following it since. And we sit down with Cherokee Nation citizen Wes Welker, a professional football star whose career could have ended much sooner. I was Oklahoma State Player of the Year. All I wanted was an opportunity and, and to play at the highest level, and I wasn't getting that opportunity. It was, it was a little frustrating at the time. We learned how he proved himself on the field and about life's new adventures. The Cherokees. A thriving American Indian tribe. Our history our culture, our people, our future, the principles of a historic nation sewn into the fabric of a modern world. Hundreds of thousands strong, learning, growing, succeeding, and steadfast. In the past, we have persevered through struggle, but the future is ours to write. OCO. 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 These are the voices of the Cherokee people. OCO, I'm Principal Chief Bill John Baker. Welcome to the Cherokee Nation and OCO TV. This is how we share our culture, our heritage, our history, and our language with you. What do? OCO, it's how we say hello in Cherokee. In this episode, we catch up with three Cherokee Nation citizens taking full advantage of the summer season. Laureen Drywater teaches us how to make priceless dolls out of summer grasses that grow here in northeastern Oklahoma. And we catch up with professional football player Wes Welker and learn about his new foray into horse racing. But first, Crystal A. Cuff Walters. She's a mother, an artist, and now an unlikely adrenaline junkie. We tag along with Crystal as she shows us her new sport, which gives her a sense of adventure and confidence. I'm not like a real big risk taker usually in general. Kind of turned into um, like overcoming a fear. I'm still scared, like it still scares me today and I have 128 jumps. On that. I'm Crystal Walters, and I am a skydiver, a mother, a graphic designer, and a fine art photographer from Pryor, Oklahoma. Pryor's really small. I think the uh, population's around 10,000. Everybody kind of knows everybody. I have three kids. Um, I have two girls and a boy. <laughs> Once all the kids were old enough to be in preschool, I decided I was going to go back to school. I was going to pursue a nursing degree. I entered an art show um, at RSU. They have an annual art show, and it's open to anyone. You didn't have to be an art student. So I entered a photograph, and I got um, second place, I think. And then I decided that I was going to pursue uh, fine art instead. I really like to use my photography and my graphic design skills like combined to, um, to make screen prints. At RSU, we had to do a capstone project, and I did a series on people that I went to school with and like their alter egos. So I did the photography on the wet plate, scanned in the wet plates, um, turned them into screen prints, and then um, screen printed on layers of mylar that would hang like so many inches apart. So then it kind of looked like the Photoshop layers, like you would lay out in a graphic design program. It showed um, them like slowly changing into like another outfit, into like another person, which would be like their alter ego. Um, down here? Yeah, that just needs to go down. So what I do is um, I go to a glass shop and I get this black glass and I cut it down to the four by five inch size, coat it with the collodion that 
pretty much turns the black glass into a sheet of film. I then take it and I soak it in the silver, which makes it photosensitive. And after I soak it in the silver, take it, put it in the camera, and it's called the wet plate process. And so I have to do this all while the, the plate is wet. So I have about um, three minutes time, I think. To do um, the wet plate process, it, the fumes are really strong and um, pretty unhealthy. So um, I researched online like how to have a mobile dark room and found that people were using those ice fishing tents. So I ordered one of those and I just took um, the ruby lid film and covered the little windows on the sides, which makes it into like a giant safe, uh, safe light. I like doing it because um, no two photos will turn out the same. Um, and I feel like nobody could really reproduce it um, if they wanted to. So I think what's most important to me is that your thumbprint is on it. So the first uh, tandem skydive I did um, was last October. I had just recently got divorced and I had reconnected with a friend that I went to high school with and he skydives. And um, he was like, you know, you should just come out and just watch or, you know, check it out, see if you might want to do a tandem. Eventually I went out there and I did one tandem on a Saturday. I went back and did a second one on the Sunday. And then um, that next weekend I signed up for the class. And then it kind of turned into, um, like overcoming a fear to kind of get away to make me feel really self-sufficient. Like I could take care of myself, I guess maybe like post-divorce. When the plane gets to about 9,000 feet, you start getting ready. Everyone kind of rotates around in the plane and you start getting prepared to do the climb out. I wouldn't say that there's ever been a time where I thought I wasn't gonna get out. Um, it's uh, definitely getting out of the plane isn't anything that I'm scared of. Um, I think it's just the landing. I think that um, the landing is the scariest part. I'm not, I'm not real great at it. It's a running joke around here if I land in the mowed grass and if I land on my feet. So we all get out and we all look at each other, make sure everyone is ready to go, and then someone will give the count um, and then we jump. I remember uh, one time I did like a student jump and I felt like I could go and run like three miles as soon as I was done. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> I feel really energetic and really hyper when I'm done. You kind of don't know what to do with yourself. <laughs> I feel like I have like kind of high anxiety and I feel like if I come out and I skydive for the weekend, it um, settles it for like a whole week. A lot of the people that come out here and skydive call it like therapeutic. Um, everybody's so happy, that's the thing. And maybe that's why it's so pleasant to be around the people out here. Cherokee Nation citizen Wes Welker has spent the last 10 years in the National Football League collecting big wins and accolades along the way. We caught up with Wes at his childhood home in Oklahoma City, where he tells us life is not just about football anymore. Wes Welker is known as one of the most impactful slot receivers in the history of the NFL. But for much of his football career, he was underestimated, always having to go further to prove himself. First undrafted, and now with more than 10 years in the NFL, Welker has won three AFC championships, gone to three Super Bowls, and holds more than 15 NFL records. He's most noted for his time playing with quarterback Tom Brady, when he became the New England Patriots' all-time career leader in receptions. Well, it's all so surreal when anything like this happens to any of your children. You know, you're just a, amazed and grateful to be a part of it. Oh, Wes has taken us many places. Mm -hmm. I'm from Oklahoma City, born in Oklahoma City. 
and went to school at Heritage Hall High School. I started playing football when I was in the sixth grade. Did people say at that point that you were small? Yeah. I mean, just because you're big doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be a great football player. You don't have to be the biggest guy. In my junior year, we went undefeated and ended up winning the state championship that year. I was Oklahoma State Player of the Year. All I wanted was an opportunity and, and to play at the highest level. And I wasn't getting that opportunity. It was, it was a little frustrating at the time. What were their reasons? What would they say? You know, not big enough, not fast enough. Right before signing day, Texas Tech had a fall through and a recruit. They had me in for a visit a few days later and signed as soon as I could. You know, basically, I, I started returning punts early on in my career. As a football fan, that's one of the most exciting things to watch. So what's that like whenever you were doing that in college? As I had more success, the crowd would start chaining my name and different things like that. And it was it was a pretty exhilarating feeling. And every time I was back there, was, my mind was set on scoring a touchdown. I didn't worry about anything else. And I set the record for uh, most punt return touchdowns in college football. After college, you didn't get drafted, right? Right. The draft is over, and I'm kind of looking around, trying to find where to go. And San Diego was the most interested in winning a uh, punt returner, and um, I took the opportunity. And what is the work ethic like? What are your days like when you become an NFL player? Really, your first few years in the league have to be all football, all the time. That's all you should be thinking about, all you should be doing, and really just studying and learning the game and learning your craft. Wes started out with the Chargers, but then he went and played with the Dolphins for three years, and then he went to New England, and New England really liked him. Getting the opportunity in New England, and then obviously being with Tom Brady and that offense and everything just kind of coming together as far as his style and then my style all just meshing together. It was just kind of the, the perfect chemistry. Going to the playoffs pretty much every year, I think, but one, going to two Super Bowls, just even the relationships and the people and the guys that uh, I met there and the group that we had, especially the 2007 team, was, was a pretty special deal. And Tom and I, we text and talk uh, quite often and um, just about life, how the kids are, it's been a new relationship. Obviously after six years in New England, I became a free agent, um, ended up going to uh, Denver, went to another Super Bowl while I was there and uh, after my two years in Denver, I was a free agent, continuing to play. Um, so tell me about Undrafted. And they're off in the Shaker town. Undrafted is uh, the horse that I've owned for the past five years now. For some reason, it's just like beginner's luck or something like that, but he's been an exceptional horse, and um, we just actually flew into Oklahoma City from uh, Lexington uh, in a race that he just won. Undrafted coming late, summation time commute, undrafted commute, something extra, undrafted rallies from deep in the pack. I saw a quote from somebody that said, undrafted is a lot like his owner, a little guy, but real tough. That's about right. I mean, he's, uh, he's a cool horse. He comes to work every day and he trains hard. He got a lot of grit to him. But yeah, the, the horses are a lot of fun just to get away from football. And, and so what's it like being a dad and a husband? <laughs> it's a uh, complete 180 from uh, the, light, the life I used to have for sure. Um, but it's been awesome. Yeah, we have our twins, Carter and Caroline, boy and girl. And uh, they're, they're a lot of fun. My son looks just like my wife, and my poor daughter, unfortunately, looks like me. We have the West Welker Foundation, which we do all sorts of grants for uh, weight rooms and equipment and all these different things for uh, high schools and communities and different things like that in the Oklahoma City uh, area. Just trying to lead those kids in the right direction and, and uh, let them know how much we care about them. Being Cherokee is uh, probably where all my toughness probably comes out. The DNA is kind of in me to want to keep pushing myself and, and persevere and, and do what I need to do to, uh, to make it. What do you see for yourself in the future? I don't know. You know, that's, that's a thing that I'm, I'm still trying to figure out. It's not like a lot of people are knocking down your door to do anything else. This is the best opportunity I have to provide for my family and also do something that I love that I know I'm good at. 
Um, I can't just sit on the couch and be retired. Like I have to do something. I think going back to from where I started, whenever the coach sat there and did the depth chart and I was last, um, and then going on and looking to play my 13th year in the, the NFL, you know, you look from that perspective, um, it's been pretty successful. You know, getting married and having kids and you know, seeing yourself within those kids has been uh, the biggest blessing uh, out there. Right now I'm just really enjoying the kids and being around and slowly trying to figure out what my next steps will be. Lura Rowland was a young teacher when she came to Indian Territory in 1897, where she intended to start a school for Indian students. A blind woman from neighboring Arkansas, Lura had noticed the need for education for the blind and visually impaired in Indian Territory. She found a home for the school in the old barracks at Fort Gibson. Located within the Cherokee Nation, but on land rented by the United States government, the Cherokee Nation allowed Ms. Rowland to repair the dilapidated buildings and make them usable for the students. Lura appealed to Congress for funding to operate her school, but found none. Instead, it was with the help of the Cherokee and Choctaw nations that the International School for the Blind was established. In 1900, the Cherokee Council granted $300 for the operations of the school. At the time, half of the six enrolled students were Cherokee. The nation would continue funding the school until statehood in 1907. In 1913, the school, renamed the Oklahoma School for the Blind, moved to its current site in Muskogee, Oklahoma. Two years later, Helen Keller visited the school. The Oklahoma School for the Blind is the only such institution in the state and retains a high population of Native students, many of whom are Cherokee Nation citizens. Let's talk Cherokee. July. Kuye Gwani. Kuye Gwani. Ota July. Kuye Gwani. Nakine Ega. Kuye Gwani. Nakine Ega. Rabbit. Cheese do. Cheese do. Rabbit is mischievous. Cheese do. Une Gujita. Tistu une Gujita. Laureen Drywater is well known here in the Cherokee Nation as the lady who makes buffalo grass dolls. She's a spunky lady and won't teach others her craft unless they're willing to do it the right way. And as you'll see, that involves a lot of hard work and patience. Uh-oh. Did you bake your pick? It's not a very big one. This one? Yeah. But, yeah. but it's got long roots. Oh, okay. So you get all the roots together uh -huh. and uh, just uh, like that. Ooh. I'm gonna scatter this a little bit, I don't, and uh, you're gonna need a tent. It's a work. It is a hard work. Uh, they wanted me to teach somebody to do this, 
And I thought, now, it, that sounds easy enough, but if they want to learn how to make uh, those buffalo grass dolls, they're going to have to dig their self and uh, learn how to clean it. Because that's the only way you're going to do it. Who wants to get out there and play with the grass? I'm the crazy one. I'm Lorene Drywater. I'm the one that makes uh, buffalo grass dolls. Buffalo grass dolls are the unique invention by Lorene Drywater. Lorene fine-tuned the whole doll thing to putting traditional Cherokee dresses on them with the bottom parts and everything and weaving up the roots into the hair. She's the only known grass dog maker in North America. Mama showed me how. I was about five. Uh, I asked her, why don't they ever buy us dolls? Uh, and she said, well, because we don't have no money. So when she first taught me how to make a doll, she said, all right, come over here and I'll show you how to make you a doll. You can make it yourself. Just follow my instruction. She told me what all to get together. I watched her. I paid attention to everything she done. And I've been following it since. When I want to make a doll, I'm going to go pull the grass out of the ground and get, wash the dirt off of it. I clean it. I wash it in a big tub of water, getting some uh, uh, roots ready, and so I can tie some strings on it. Hang on. This is the neck. Now this is going to be the body. It's a broomweed. It's a kind, that kind of stuff that grows out there in the pasture. Okay, here's a uh, starting of one. These are her arms. The, the, the face is supposed to be right there. And the arms and the body. How does this look as a blouse? I try not to dress them all less the same. And this is how it would look. Like this. Whenever they are dressed. Sewing was my favorite. I even fixed my own dress. If I tore my dress, I fixed it myself. And of course it didn't look as neat as it would if Mama did it. But Mama didn't have time. She had too many little ones. <laughs> She's a national treasure for making Cherokee tear dresses and and, uh, and clothes. And for her to transition into a doll form is very unique. She loves the woods and her plants. And that's what Cherokee they like, is the woods and her plants. She applies traditional indigenous knowledge systems into her work. That's what's very unique about Lorraine. She puts it all together and has a unique contemporary art form. It's distinctly hers. And this is my, my mom. Uh, she, she dressed like that. I made that dress. Everything I had, I made myself or, or somebody made it. And here's my, my grass dolls. I was working on them. I'm just so used to doing things on my own. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, they know what I do. They know what uh, I made, and they know where to find them. So that's it. We hope you enjoyed our show. And remember, you can always watch entire episodes and share your favorite stories online at oco.tv. There is no Cherokee word for goodbye. We say, don't adago ha e. We'll see each other again. So until next time, wado. It's your turn to visit the Cherokee Nation and explore 66,000 acres of lush Oklahoma countryside, scenic rivers and lakes, and engaging cultural attractions, like the John Ross Museum and Cemetery in Park Hill. 
The museum is set in a former rural schoolhouse built in 1913 and highlights the life and legacy of the influential Cherokee chief John Ross. Ross was principal chief of the Cherokee Nation for nearly 40 years during one of the most tumultuous and impactful times in its history. Born in 1790, Ross was a native of the old Cherokee Nation in what is now Georgia. He rose to prominence at a young age, and by 1827, Ross had served his nation as a delegate to Washington, D.C., as a veteran of the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, and as president of the Cherokee National Committee. In 1828, John Ross was elected principal chief of the Cherokee Nation for the first of many terms. Ross fought tirelessly against President Andrew Jackson's Indian removal policy, determined to protect the Cherokee homelands. Ultimately, Ross was unsuccessful in preventing the devastation that was the Trail of Tears. So he led the Cherokees to the new Indian Territory, where they would rebuild their government with Chief Ross at the helm. Ross and his family settled in Park Hill, Indian Territory, near present-day Tahlequah, Oklahoma. After a lifetime of working to preserve the sovereignty of the Cherokee Nation, Chief John Ross died in Washington, D.C. in 1866, campaigning for his people and his nation until the very end. He is buried in the Ross Cemetery in Park Hill, situated just behind the John Ross Museum. The cemetery is on the National Register of Historic Places and is the burial grounds for many in the Ross family, important Cherokee delegates, and survivors of the Trail of Tears. In addition to highlighting the life and legacy of Chief John Ross, the museum houses exhibits and interactive displays on the Trail of Tears, Civil War, Cherokee Golden Age, and Cherokee Nation's passion for the education of its people. The museum also has a gift shop and research area. To plan your visit to the museum, go to visitcherokeenation.com. In the Cherokee Nation, news happens every day. Cherokee Nation's economic impact on the state of Oklahoma now exceeds $2 billion. The dollars that are generated here are creating jobs. It benefits everyone. Creating headlines. The new 469,000 square foot health facility is the result of the largest joint venture agreement ever. For the people of the Cherokee Nation, it will impact them for generations to come. Creating opportunities. Cherokee Nation employees can now take eight weeks of paid maternity leave. We have lots of young mothers and young families, and this is something that's very exciting. This year, the tribe awarded $5 million to superintendents from about 100 public school districts. When it comes to education, we're all in it together. Creating a better place to call home. The Wilma P. Mankiller Health Center in Stillwell, Oklahoma, nearly doubled in size. But this absolutely will make a tremendous impact on the quality of life. It's going to provide more jobs. For more Cherokee Nation news, visit onadiscoe.com.